children. You know, there was probably, I, don't, I didn't count, several hundred children that came through uh, the firehouse yesterday. And I just saw smiles all around and, and just the kids, the, they kept coming back and playing the games over and over again. They really enjoyed themselves. They did the crafts. It was really nice to see them sit, doing the crafts, which, you know, every, you know everything had a, a Christian, just about a Christian theme to it. You know, we, we took the, the devil out of, of their Halloween event and, and put Christ into it. And I thought that was just a, a wonderful, wonderful time. But, you know, I was thinking about as I was preparing the sermon and thinking about children and I I've looked up, I found a survey called What Parents Really Want for Their Children. It was just a couple years old. They surveyed over 5,000 parents in 16 countries. The majority, 64%, want their children to be happy in life. You know, 72% of Americans said, you know, said, what do you want for your children? I want my children to be happy in life. And, and that's, we all, we all do, don't we? Um, Next, and the rest were all around 30%, but next was lead a healthy lifestyle. Very noble, followed closely by earn enough to enjoy a comfortable life, be successful in their career, fulfill their potential. These are things that we all want for our children, uh, you know, even, my, even myself. And for the, you know, is this any different for Christian parents? I don't think it is. We all want our children to be happy, to be successful, to fulfill their potential. But however, we like to, we will include faith to this list, won't we? We want our children to keep their faith, to have a faith in God. So there, what Barna did a study, and it said 58% of practicing Christians, and it had different ones, but I just, but you know, uh, practicing Christian parents are very concerned their children stay true to their faith. Which to me seems like, shouldn't that be a hundred percent? But anyway, it was 58 percent. 28 percent says or somewhat concerned that their children keep their faith. Nine percent not very concerned and seven percent not concerned at all. And, and it just, that really is a picture of Christians. You know, we would think, we would like to think that a hundred percent of Christians are, their primary concern is that their children have of knowledge, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Like that should be number one for all Christian parents. But the truth is, it's, it's not. I mean, as far as, you know, the study shows, but I see that because even in our own lives as adults, you know, our faith isn't of utmost importance among practicing Christians. We will, you know, we have all of those other aspirations for ourselves to be happy in life, to fulfill our potential, to, have, to, to make a good living, to provide well for ourselves. And we have faith in there somewhere, faith as of, as of importance to us. And so it's not surprising to me that that's what we, we would want for our kids. And you know, you only know, you know where you're at in that. And I hope by the end of the service, you will be able to place, see yourself where, where you do place faith in your life. You know, it's easy to say that we put faith at the top, but do our lives actually show that we have put faith at the top? Or are we more concerned with being happy or, or being pr prosperous or, or fulfilling our potential or all these other things? What does God want for his children? He wants what's best for his children, doesn't he? He absolutely wants what's best for, for his children, just as all parents want what's best for their children. And we just have different views on what's best. But God, only what God wants for us above all else, the top of God's list for us. Well, what, are, what, is, what does God want above all else? Well, he wants us to be holy, right? Well, that's not at the top of the list. Oh, he wants us to be sanctified and set apart and, and, and he wants us to be good and, and, and no, none of that's at the top of the list. What's at the top of God's list? God just wants us, his children to know him. God wants his children above all else to know him. And when we put anything above that, when we put being good, being holy, it hinders us from knowing him as he wants us to know him. And Paul's going to give us a good example of that. But there are many verses in the Bible that make this clear. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life. You got to keep up. <laughs> we got a new guy. <laughs> and this is eternal life. This is life that they, us, may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is life that we would know God above all else. Jeremiah 9, 24. 
But let him who glories in previous in verse 23, he's talking about glorying in knowledge and glorying in, in, in wisdom. And, but above all else, let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. What does he delight in? Is it your righteousness? Is it your holy? He delights in you knowing him, in experiencing him. That's God's number one delight. And we're going to read it in our text today, Philippians 3.10. Paul says, that I may know him. And there's several others, but the ultimate goal of every Christian should be to get to know God, to get to know God and experience God in, in an intimate way. Psalm 27, 8 said this, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. That's why I said, stay in the attitude of worship today. God wants to speak to your heart that your heart will say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you more than anything. You are the, knowing you, Lord, is the most important thing above my happiness, above my anything is knowing you. God's telling us to seek his face. Our heart should be like that of the psalmist, David, to seek him, to desire God more than anything or anyone. That should be our heart, church. There is power. At, this is the key to life. The key to life is wanting to know God above everything else. It's the key to joy. Jeremiah 29, 14, he says, you will seek me. Is that right? Maybe it's 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And then it goes on to, to say that. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God is telling us to seek his face. This is something I learned a long time ago that radically changed my life. Because I thought I was seeking him with all my heart. I was seeking him. And I did have a heart for God. But when I put truly put God above everything else, it changed my life forever. That's why I'm here today. And, and it's, it's all coming to a head today, church. It's coming to a head today. And I hope you're ready to receive it. Receive the message today. You know, to truly desire Jesus more than anything, more than your sin, more than your family, more than your happiness, more than your job, more than your children, more than your potential, more than your money, more than your time. To put him above everything else is the key to opening, unlocking life for you, to unlocking freedom, to unlocking joy, to unlocking happiness, to unlocking everything else. It's truly putting him first. I'll share my testimony of when this happened to me. But first, I'm gonna look at Paul's testimony. Many of you have heard it, but I think it's time. Some of you need to hear it, or for the first time, or hear it again. You know, Paul had a closeness and a freedom in the Lord, didn't he? That few people will ever experience, unfortunately. But he had something, there was something about Paul, and you sense it, you feel it. I hope you feel it when you read Paul's, Paul's letters. The, this, this something that Paul experienced, an intimacy with God that he just desires us to have. He desires his readers to have. That's where he's writing from. He, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercy. He's, he's begging, he's pleading. He says in Romans, he's, he's constantly begging us, listen, if we would just do this, if we, it's not not just so that we would be better people, so that we would be holy, so that we would look good. And it's for it's so that we would experience what Paul has experienced in relationship to God. I believe I experienced that freedom. I believe I've experienced it. And what did I want? <laughs> the same thing Paul wanted. And and he and Paul's been praying about it. And I've been praying for years. I've been trying to get people to find that freedom and closeness to God. And like Paul will say, we'll see next week. Not that I've arrived, not that I've we perfected anything, but if you know something good, you want it for everybody else. Your heart, when you know something, there's something that will change our life, something that will, will bring about a new revelation, a closer walk with Jesus. You want to share that with people and you could recognize when they don't have it. Paul recognized that this was lacking in the churches. And this is why he wrote that. I've been, I've seen that this has been lacking in churches for years now. And, and it's what drove me to, 
to be a pastor. It's what drove me to pray on Tuesday mornings for years. Not just here. I used to do that back in my, in my old church. I would get up at six, I'd be at the church at six o'clock in the morning in the pitch black praying for the church because I knew what God had for the church, what he expected, what he wants for the church that we would know him. Last week, we only covered the first three verses of chapter three, and I'll just read them over again to to refresh us. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. So Paul was using some serious language to convey the seriousness of of legalism, of adding anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Judaizers were coming behind Paul when he would minister, telling the converts that Paul's seeing people converted, that salvation wasn't in faith by faith wasn't enough, that they needed to add some legalistic ritual like circumcision or and things like that to the, to their faith. They had to go through Judaism, Judaism to be a Christian, and and Paul's calling them dogs and evil workers and mutilated or mutil. Oh, excuse me, mutilizers. I still don't say that right. Mutilators, thank you. They're literally mutilating the grace of God. God's going to have to work through me in my sleep-deprived state. <laughs> then he goes on to say what a true believer looks like. You know, a true believer worships God in the spirit. You know, when we lift our hands, it's, it's from the heart. It's an act of surrender. It's not just something that we do. When we, when we worship God through communion, it's not just taking a, a wafer and some grape juice. It's, it's, it's worshiping Him from, from our hearts. It's, it's, it's what, it's, the issue's always the heart. It's what's coming out of the heart is what a true worshiper does. It's not in the ritualistic things. We, that's why we guard against making them, you know, just something that we do. They rejoice in Christ. Jesus, not in anything they have done. We, we don't, we take no pride in what we have done, but we rejoice in Jesus Christ and what He has done. And we take no confidence in ourselves for salvation or anything else, but we have full confidence that what Jesus did on the cross is sufficient for us. And we don't have to add anything to that. We just received the love of Christ. We received the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, knowing that we have no confidence. There's nothing that we did. It's everything that He did. That's what a true believer looks like. And then we pick it up here in verse 4, because Paul gives his own testimony regarding these things. He says, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I so more. So regarding these dogs who undermine grace and boast of their external spirituality, he says, I'll put my record against these any day. If anybody could be saved through works, through righteousness, it's, it's me, Paul. He says, Circumcised, he gives his qualif- he gives his qualifications here. Circumcised in the eighth day, the stock of Israel. So, re- or of the tr- where he was um, born a Jew, circumcised on the eighth day according to the exact regulation of the law. What is this saying? He had good parents. He had parents that made sure he was in the temple getting circumcised when the law said he was to be circumcised. He had godly parents. They, they cared. Do you care about raising your kids up in the fear and admonition of the Lord? You know, we, good parents do that. Good parents, you know, they, they, that was on the top of their list. You know, okay, Paul, we're going to make sure you're a godly man and then we'll worry about your happiness and we'll worry about everything else. So they put God, they were godly parents. They wanted to make sure, and we see it in his life, that he was raised in the Jewish um, religion faithfully. They reared him according to the law of Moses. It says, of the tribe of Benjamin. So he took pride in the tribe that he was from. It's like saying he belonged to the best family. The tribe of Benjamin was a highly regarded family. They were the ones who remained loyal to Judah when everybody the other ten tribes split and they, they stayed with Judah. They were Israel's first king. King what? Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. It's very possible that Paul, when he was before he was Paul, he was Saul, was named after King Saul. You know, godly parents name their children godly names a lot of times, don't they? And he says, concerning the law of Pharisee. So he was, I'm sorry, (laughs) a Hebrew of the Hebrews. 
his family maintained the Hebrew customs. They spoke the Hebrew language. Many at that time were, were, they were integrating and, you know, Greek customs and everything, things into their faith, speaking Greek language. Paul's family stayed true to their, who they were. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. They didn't do any of that. Their, their lineage was, was pure. They didn't mix anything. He was a Jew of Jews, a Hebrew of Hebrews. They didn't allow the Greek culture to impact their family and a Pharisee. The Pharisees represented the very best in Israel. The highest ideal a Jew could ever hope to attain was to be a Pharisee. And most didn't want to do that. Who wants to be a Pharisee? They kept the law to the minutest detail of the law. They followed the law. And we, when we think of Pharisees, we think of hypocrisy, don't we? Because we know that Jesus, you know, confronted them with that. But back then, they were highly regarded. You know, they were highly regarded for their, their, their religious, you know, spirit that they had for keeping the law, you know, per- perfectly to, to the, you know, every extent of the law. Concerning zeal, verse 6, persecuting the church. Paul thought he was doing God's will when he persecuted the church. The other Pharisees, they were willing to relax when they ran the Jews, were the Christians out of Jerusalem. But Paul's like, no, I'm going to go get them. I'm going to chase them down. He, he, beyond, he went above and beyond what the other Pharisees were doing. That, that's, he was on the road, remember the road to Damascus, on his way to, pers- to find Christians so he could lock them up. He was zealous. Concerning the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. That's quite a statement for anyone to say, isn't it? (laughs) Blameless. But Paul, was he tried to follow the law. And if he didn't, well, he would make the appropriate sacrifice. He would make sure. He was mindful of it. He didn't just accept failure. He didn't accept sin. If he, we know he talks later, you know, he had covetousness, covetousness, but if, if he sinned, if he felt he sinned, he made sure he made the appropriate sacrifice. Sometimes we just settle, you know, okay, there's sin in my life. Not what Paul said. No, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of this sin. I'm going to be blameless. Then here, starting here in verse seven, he starts to use, he took all those things and he starts to use some accounting terms. These seven things, his upbringing, his lineage, his devotion to the Hebrew customs, his keeping the law, his zeal, his righteousness. Well, if you had a ledger sheet, he's talking about, verse 7 says, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted for loss. So he put those things, they were on his, his, his gain, his positive side, his, his gain, his, um, asset side. These are his assets. And he said, what I thought were my assets, I, I have to take them and move them to the loss side because they, they, what, I, they, what I thought made me so good, so righteous, so holy, so set apart, I realized they were holding me back from knowing Jesus. It's those things that we think are worthwhile and best and, and that those things that we do that can actually keep us from knowing God. This is the problem. When you look at this list, it's an impressive list. Paul was adding up his background, his character, his religion, and it was impressive. And, and they're all good things, aren't they? None of those things are bad in and of themselves, are they? You know, we, we want those things. We want our children to be raised in a godly household we, to make sure the family name is good for them, right? We want to, you know, protect their reputation, our reputation. So, so th- he had all of these things. He, Make sure the family name is good. Not get mixed up in worldly things. Keep the law. Be zealous for God. These are all good things. The, this is the problem. Those things are good in and of themselves. And you know what? Actually, wouldn't God use those things in Paul to make him really the great apostle that he was? God, he, the knowledge that he had in the Word of God, the Old Testament prophecies and everything he knew, his zeal, his, his devotion. He, God would use all of those things. God will use whatever is in you today Lord, when, when you give it to him, when you take it from, and put it from your, li- from your asset side to, the, to your liability side. He will use those things. He can't do nothing with it when it's, when it's in your strength and in your power on your good side. Look at what I can do. No, when you take it and you count it a loss, well, that's when he takes whatever that is and he turns it around for your good. He will use it for good. 
And they're all good things, but they're not the best thing. Compared to knowing Christ, Paul counts them as a loss. He takes them from the asset side to the liability side. They were actually a hindrance to him knowing Jesus. All the knowledge, the good upbringing, he missed Jesus when Jesus was right in front of them. Think about it. Paul was serving God when Jesus was walking from town to town. And Paul's trying to figure this guy out. But because of his upbringing, because of his godly religious upbringing, he missed Jesus right in front of him. How would you feel today if Jesus is walking around and, and we're, we reject him because we can't see him through our religiosity or through, for, through whatever it might be? Think about that. How, would you think he would be kicking himself? All the things he could have done with Jesus in those three and a half years, yet, yet he's looking for ways to persecute this guy, to discredit this guy, as with all the Pharisees were doing. How would you like? That could be us today. We could be missing Jesus because of our religiosity or, or, or whatever, whatever our thing might be. Whatever the hindrance is, he let religion keep him from relationship with Jesus. So he let it all go. Not the, none of it mattered. His prestige, none of it mattered compared to Christ. That's what you did, church, when you truly got saved. You stopped trying to be good. You simply accepted by faith the grace of God, didn't you? You did. We, did. we all did. I spoke with a man the other day in the hospital. Um, he was actually a friend of Pastor Ross's. Pastor Ross was with me, and we wanted to go talk to him. And He was an older gentleman who his father was a pastor, he knew all about God, you know, he knew all about God, and, but he was, you know, he wasn't living for God. And Pastor Ross asked him, he said, do, do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And he said, yes. And, and then he said, and I loved his answer, he said, yes, but not today. And he said, what do you, why not today? Well, because he knew. He, he knew the Word of God, and he knew himself, and he knew that, what to, listen, when I get out of this hospital, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get a cigarette, and I'm going to go to the liquor store. And he knew what he was going to do, he, these, the, the, the things. And right away, I knew what he, where he was coming from. He didn't, he didn't want to be a hypocrite. He knew what God required, yet he let what God required hold him from relationship with God. And I knew that he came up in a legalistic church. His, he, he grew up learning the law and, and, and believing if you do this, God will be happy with you and bless you if you don't do this. And he grew up in legalism, not know, understanding the grace of God. So his legalist background is keeping him from relationship with God. So I was a, glad I got to minister to him, you know, the love of Christ and, and, and to Pastor Ross, the love of Christ. And he knows it. And Pastor Ross is, is it's funny. I learned so much from him and, and he does learn a little bit from me sometimes. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll tell you that. And, and it's just so neat to see. It's such a, such a, a wonderful relationship we have. And, and, and just to minister the grace of God to somebody who knows him, but doesn't know him. And, and salvation isn't in, listen, God doesn't care about your cigarettes or your drinking as much as he cares about knowing you. And we have to put that first. Seek, seek, just seek him. Don't worry about what you're going to go out and do. Worry about what you're going to go out and, and just pursue Jesus. You've heard me talk about that. It's not necessary to bring it up. I used to be the same way. You know, there was some legalism where I came from, and I just felt if I had a bad week, well, God wasn't happy with me that week. If I if I fell into sin that week, that I couldn't, I didn't even want to go to church. Or if I did, I wanted to kind of hide. I hope hopefully the pastor don't call me to pray today because I don't deserve to be up in front of people and pray. Is that the way our heavenly Father looks at His children? Nope, you can't pray today. I know what you did. No, He knows none of us are perfect. All have sinned. But he wants us to pray. He wants us to seek his face. He wants us to pursue after him regardless. And, and what happens when we do that? Well, we grow. We grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. First, verse 8 says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now he counted Past tense. In verse 7, he counts or now or continues to count. Salvation isn't just something that happens for a moment, church. 
And this, this is a problem. It's not when you just, something that happens when you go to the altar, have an experience. It's something that continues for a lifetime, that we continue to count all things as a loss. You know, the, I love the way the New Living Translation gives verse 8, if we have that. Yes, everything else is worthless. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. What's the first thing on Paul's list? Knowing Jesus Christ. What is everything else compared to it? Happiness, prestige, fame, fortune, money. It doesn't matter. Everything is counted as what? Garbage. The word actually means horse manure. All of his accomplishments. Think about that. Picture that for a minute. You take all your accomplishments, all your achievements, and you pile them up before the Lord. Oh, Lord, look how good I am. Look how beautiful this is. And what does God see you piling up? You're, this is your Lord. This is beautiful. And he sees this pile of horse manure getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, what you, I don't want your horse manure. That's useless. It's garbage. It's, when we see it as horse manure, well, that's when we can be start piling up good things for the Lord. Amen. Treasures for God. He said, Paul had an impeccable religious pedigree, yet he counted it as nothing because God, honestly, that's what God, God counts it as nothing too until you give it to him. Once you stop counting it as everything, well, then he counts it as something. Oh, so all that devotion, all that zeal, all that pedigree you have, now that it's on your liability side, well, now it's valuable. Now he can use it. Now God can use it because you're stop using it for yourself. His achievements were counted as rubbish. So verse 9, and we're getting there. Bear with me. And he found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God by faith. So Paul let go of everything he once held dear, everything he once felt secure in and found himself in Jesus simply by faith. And he found, But what he found, church, was so much more. So much more. Do you think it was easy for Paul to let those things go? This was his identity. This pe- the people looked up to him. People followed him. He let go of everything that he once felt dear. And what he found was so much more, so much greater. And this is what Paul wants you to know. Whatever you hold dear in your heart, if it's not if Jesus isn't greater, if you don't consider it as rubbish, and church, I know we don't, but if we don't consider it as rubbish, we will never know the ex- 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 excellency of knowing Jesus Christ. Oh, but I know him. I know what you're thinking, but I know him. I know Jesus. Do you really know Jesus Few of us can make this claim. Listen, it's why Paul says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of the sufferings being conformed to the to his death. He says that I may know him. And this sums up Paul's primary pursuit in life, to know Christ. All is rubbish compared to knowing Christ. This is what the Bible is all about, church. And this is where the power is. This is where the resurrection power of God is. You know, where's the resurrection power? Well, you have to want to know him and consider everything else rubbish. When you do that, there is a power, a resurrection power of God. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, which will be unleashed in your life to do that. You can consider suffering. You will call consider suffering fellowship that you will consider dying to yourself a, a joy. You know, and this is where Paul was. He found so much more. And few of us can make this claim. Most of us have checked our ledger sheet sheet, and figured, well, we're good enough to get to heaven. My good outweighs my bad, and, and I'm good with that. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to church. I'm checking off the good, right things. And yeah, there's a few things on the, on the bad side, but, but it's okay. I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. And, and that's how we go through our Christian life. We get to a certain point and then we just stop growing. We just become content where we are. We know that we're saved. And I'm not saying we're not, but do we really know the Lord? 
have you arrived to a place? Have, have you, do you know Jesus better today than you did 10 years ago? I sure hope so. Do you know him better today than you did a year ago? I sure hope so. Or are you further from the Lord today than you were 10 years ago? Man, that's the case, state, case, the state of many Christians today. We get to a place where we just start coasting along. We hit a wall. We hit a wall and we just stop there and we just hang out there at the wall. We get comfortable at the wall. So we honestly, we have to honestly ask ourselves, do we value knowing Christ above all else? And the answer for most of us is no. Do you love like Jesus loved? Do you have joy or are you miserable? Do you have peace or do you worry all the time? Do you have patience? Are you kind? Are you gentle? Do you have self-control? You know, I hear it a lot as a pastor. Oh, I'm just a worrier. I can't help it. Well, that's not of God. God could set you free from that. If you worry, you know, I mean, yeah, things are bad happen, don't they? But doesn't the Bible say, isn't, isn't peace a, a fruit of the Spirit, a fruit of knowing God? So why do you worry? It's because you don't, there's part of you that doesn't know God like you could. He hasn't delivered you from that. So don't tell me I'm just a worrier. I'll tell you, but it's, you know what? It's okay. It's something you can work on, but get to know God. Don't worry about worrying. We worry about worrying now. Do you have a short temper? Do you lose control? Yeah, it's just who I am. It's how I was raised. My father had a had a bad temper. I have a bad temper. I lose control. Not for the Christian, not for them who know God. You know, Paul had self-control issues, didn't he? Yeah, he got rid of them as he got to know God. God set him free from that. There is freedom from all of these things in knowing Christ Jesus. But we just settle for these things. Do you have sin in your life that's controlling you? You know it's sin, but you're powerless to overcome it. Well, you know, I've had this since I was a kid. Since I was a teenager, I've been carrying this sin around. And, and you know what? I'm going to church, and I'm comfortable. And you hang out at that wall, you and your sin. And you have a relationship with God, a, a knowledge of God, but you still have this sin. Listen, if Paul's righteousness, Paul's righteousness was counted as filthy rags, what does he count your sin as? Who knows? If righteousness is as filthy rags, what does your sin look like before the Lord? He can't even look upon it. For Paul, it was his religion, his self-righteousness, his pedigree, the status that all that came kept him from knowing Jesus. What's holding you back? Do you know Jesus like Paul knew Jesus? How did Paul know Jesus? Yeah. Could there be more to life than just being happy, healthy, and successful? Could there be more to Jesus than what you're experiencing right now. There's got to be more to Jesus, church, than what we're experiencing right now. There's got to be more. We have to, that should be our prayer. There's got to be more to you than what I'm experiencing right now. When I read Paul's writings and I feel his passion for wanting his readers to know Jesus like he knew Jesus. But like Paul, I found that just telling people isn't good enough. You have to pray for people. You have to pray for him. I've been praying for years. And, and, and when God changed my life, he gave me a prayer. He gave me Paul's prayer. And when I, when I read it, I don't know how many times I read it before, but when I read it after God changed my life, I heard it and I saw it for the first time. And it's this prayer here in Ephesians chapter 3. I'll read it to you. And feel Paul's passion in this. For this reason. For what reason? Because this is what I want you to know, church. I bow my knee to the Father. He's praying for the, the, the Christians in Ephesus. I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family, so he's praying for us all, in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. What's the riches of his glory? Everything. Out of his glory, complete, uninhibited access to God is the riches of his glory. God doesn't hold anything back from us. So he's praying that we would receive from the riches of his glory. You know, what? To be strengthened with his might through, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So strength comes from 
God to us in our inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints. So this is the prayer. This is what Paul wants us to experience. What is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of God, of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him is able, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. There's got to be more to Jesus than what I'm experiencing right now. Are you experiencing the width and the length and the depth of the love and the knowledge of the love of Christ in your life today? Or do you think maybe there's more? Maybe there could be more. Paul experienced more. When Paul took everything he counted, everything he valued in life and put it as a liability and he surrendered it and counted it as rubbish compared to knowing Jesus, he was filled with the, 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 with the depth of the knowledge of the love of Jesus Christ. And he walked in it and he lived in it and he wanted it for everybody. And let me tell you my experience. When I became a Christian, well, that first year was kind of just, I was pursuing Jesus, but I didn't want to change. You know, you, you heard my story, and I didn't want to give up anything. But then God got, about a, after about a year, God got a hold of my life. And he, and then I, just, I said, and I, I made a conscious decision, Lord, I want to identify with you. And God began to do an amazing thing. He began to do a sanctifying work in my life. And I, and, and I was always in my Bible, and I'd be praying and seeking the Lord, and, and sins were just falling off left and right. My mouth, my, the drinking, the drugs, everything, and, and the list goes on and on. And for about five years, I'm just growing. If you could chart my life, you, my spiritual life, you would see it was just taken off. It was just taken off. And then I got, after about five years, I just, I, I hit a wall. I hit a wall and I knew it because I, I just hit a wall and, and I wasn't growing anymore, but I was pursuing Jesus and I was, I was still reading my Bible and I was still praying and I still had a heart to want to know God, but I wasn't growing anymore and I knew what it was. There was a sin in my life from the time I was a teenager till, till the time I was, I was probably 25 at this time and, and I, I was powerless to overcome it. And I would go to the altar and I would cry and I would repent and I would go back to my seat and knowing that I had been forgiven, but knowing that I was still bound by this sin, that I hit a wall and, and, and I'm just hanging out at that wall. And, and unfortunately, that's where most of us stop. We pursue Jesus until we hit that wall and then we just hang out at that wall. Well, this ain't so bad. I got my sin. I tried. I can't do anything about it. So we live with it, whatever that sin might be. Maybe it's whatever it might be. It could be anything that you are putting above growing in Jesus and the knowledge of Jesus is a sin. And we just camp out there. And, and most people, most churches, they grow to a certain point and they hit that wall and they just camp out there. And it's not bad. You know, we, we had a, somebody in our fellowship had a vision. Was, I think it was last week. And in the vision, they saw a wall up here in our church, right here, a wall. There's, 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 you know, as a church, we have grown, grown so far, haven't we? It's been four and a half years, and and I've see the spiritual growth in us, you know, and I see us growing and maturing in God, and and all those who show and we show up and we we care about our community and we do outreach events, and and we're good, aren't we? We're doing really good. But 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 we I believe we're church God is telling us we're at a wall. Because that that vision, well, I don't know if it was that weekend or another or the following weekend, a lady in another church had the same vision, saw the same wall in front of our church. In front of right here. Another and they shared it with a person from our church. The, the same vision was confirmed by two people, one in this church, one in another church. Well, that makes me pay attention, doesn't it? Well, I believe God gave me the interpretation of that vision because we've come to a place as a fellowship where we hit a wall. We're just there. And, and we can hang out here and we, we'll see growth. We'll see people come into our fellowship. We'll, we'll build a building and we'll see it grow. But, what, but the, And we can hang out at this wall. That's where most churches camp. They, they grow to a certain place and then they camp at the wall. Well, this pastor has been on the other side of that wall. So this pastor knows that there's more 
to knowing Christ than camping out at this wall. See, after about five years of pursuing God, he didn't leave me there. Somehow he got me to Florida. There was a revival taking place in Florida, and I didn't go down there with any agenda other than to see what was going on, but God had a plan for me down there. And I saw some things, I saw things down there that, that, that expanded my view of God. That there is more to knowing Jesus than what I'm experiencing right now. And, and, and I wanted that. And I knew, I'm, I'm listening to stories of people getting delivered saved, set free from drugs and alcohol abuse and all other sorts of stuff. Stuff, And I said, all right, I'm going. I'm going to the altar. So I went to the altar and I said, Lord, you know what's holding me back. You know the sin that has bound me and has been keeping me back, that the wall that is in front of me. And I repented of the Lord in tears and people prayed for me. And, and, and I went back to my seat and no, I knew that I was forgiven, but I also knew that I was still bound. Lord, so that was the last night. I was down there, you know, for three or four days, and I'm driving home, drove through the night <laughs> on a Saturday night. Lord, I, I, you know my heart. You know, I, I, I want you more than, and more than this sin. You know, I want you more than anything, Lord. Why am I still bound? You know, and, and I get home, and Joyce is getting ready for church. Get home Sunday morning after driving through tonight. I said, but you, you're gonna have to go without me. I'm, I'm too tired to go to church. So I sit, I get in bed. And I just tossed and turned. And I was like, all right, God wants me to go to church. So I, I get up, I go to church, the, the service is just about over. I get there just in time for the altar call. And, and, I, and, and I just said, I gotta go to the altar. And I got down at the altar. Whew. It's been a little while since I got to share this. And God met me right there. The resurrection power of God met me there because I had a heart that truly, for the first time, truly wanted to know him more than the sin that I had in my life. And in that moment, God unleashed a power in me. And literally, in my spiritual mind, I could, it felt like, like God just took a demon off of my back. The talons were in my back. Just ripped it off. Ripped it off. And I could just cry. Cry out to the Lord. I don't know how long I was there, but when I got up, the church was empty. And uh, my pastor was there, and he was getting up from praying. And he looked, he's like, uh, and I just looked at him. I said, it's gone. He didn't know what I was talking about. I said, it's gone. I knew I was free. Free to for what? Free to know Jesus like I never knew him before. Uninhibited access to God. Uninhibited. I just, worship was different. It, I didn't need music. I didn't need anything. From the time the first note was played, I was connected to God. Everything about me. Temptation. There was no temptation to sin. I remember going to skiing with a couple guys and, and it was just the three of us and, and, and I see their eyes light up. We're sitting at a table and they're like, oh, you gotta look, you gotta see. They were Christians. You won't believe this girl that just walked in. I'm like, I'm not looking. I don't care. I don't care about that. Like, it ain't gonna hurt you to look. I was like, yeah, oh, yes, it will. I am not, there is no girl in this world worth me losing what God is doing in my life right now. There's nothing that could stand in the way of what I have in Jesus Christ right now. Nothing. Is, everything is counted as a loss. Everything. And church, it was just me. That's where Paul was. I'm in the church and, and God says, it's not just you. Yeah, I, you need to pray this. And he gave me this prayer. Begin praying this for your church. And I began praying that for my church. And what happened to that church? It got worse and worse and worse until the doors were finally closed. So God brought me down here and then to Georgetown. And then he brought me here to Dagsboro. This isn't just for Dagsboro. It's for the church. He wants us to experience 
himself like we've never experienced him before. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how long you've been knowing the Lord. This message is for you to count everything as loss compared to the knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ. How do you get there? How do you get to that point? You just keep seeking him. I was talking to a lady the other day. Her world's falling apart, falling apart. And she's been, you know, she's burned out all the other pastors. Somehow it got down to me. And I just listened to her and I said, listen, I can't help you unless you're helping yourself. If you're, if, if, are you reading your Bible? Are you seeking the Lord? If I talk to you again, if you want to talk to me again, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, are you reading your, what did you read in your Bible? What have you been talking to the Lord about? If you can't answer that question, well, I'm not going to talk to you. I don't want no part. I can't help you unless you are seeking the Lord. Are you reading your Bible trying to find Jesus? Are you praying to Jesus? Lord, show me who you are. Are you wanting, is, does your heart want to know him? And when you do, whatever, whatever is on your gain side right now, he will remove that. Whatever sin you have bound, you're bound up in, seek the Lord and he will find a way. Maybe he'll have to bring you to Florida or somewhere else. Maybe he brought you here this morning. Whatever it is, when you truly in your heart want Jesus more than you want anything in your life that is above him, seek him. See, I don't believe it's going to happen today. I don't. Maybe it might happen for somebody. I believe we have to put the work in. We have to be, seek me with all of your heart and I will be found by you, he says. Go home this week and seek the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Put value him, value knowing him above everything else and he will find a way to set you free. He will find a way that when you are ready. It took a while. It took probably three, four years till I was ready, till I was truly ready. But that is what he wants to do. Church, we are at a place where there's a wall. There's a wall. And, and, and guess what? He doesn't want us hanging around. This is a good church. I, I brag on you guys. I tell Pastor Rick how special this place is. But church, I know it's on the other side of that wall. I know the freedom and the power that's on the other side of that wall. That's why I'm here. Not to babysit. Not to have a good church. He could have brought anybody here. He could have brought anybody here for that. If that's why he wanted me here, if that's who he wanted here, he wouldn't have brought me here. He brought me here because I know it's on the other side of that wall. And we're at a place right now where we're hanging out. We've gotten to the wall. Now what are we going to do about it? Seek the Lord with all your heart. And guess what? You'll find him. I promise you, you'll find him. There's more to, to Jesus than you're experiencing right now. I really don't know how to end the sermon. <laughs> I hope God's spoken to your heart today. I know I hope you know that there's more to Jesus. <laughs> there's more. It's hard to stay in that place by yourself. You know, I was on that mountaintop for about two years for about two years, and, and, and it's hard to be by, by yourself, you know, praying. My heart went out to my church, and, and they just kept, man, just their, 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 their legalism and everything else just kept pushing God away until God said, that's enough, and he shut the doors to that church, you know. Let it not be, church. God's looking for a church. Listen, if it's not this church, it's going to be another church. God is looking for the church to be all that it could be in Christ Jesus. Amen. And, and, and let it be. Let, let revival start here. When other people are having visions about this church, God's trying to do something in this church. You know, listen, it, it, takes, it takes a few. I remember um, I was a youth leader. I wasn't the head youth leader, but man, our youth group was struggling. And until three boys got saved from a, they were from the, in the public school and they said, we need a, we need to, I don't know how, I don't remember how they got saved, but they got saved and they got caught fire for God. And, and they came into our youth group, our dead youth group, and they lit that youth group up, man. Then it, all of a sudden, I mean, the Holy Spirit's there and, 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 and it just, and, and the Holy, God just caught fire in that youth group and revival spread in that youth group. Give me one, give me two, give me three of you willing to seek the Lord. 
Let it be all of us. Why can't it be all of us? Seek the Lord with all of your heart. I'm begging you. God is begging you. Get up in the morning and read your Bible. Lord, show me. Reveal yourself to me. Ask him. Lord, give me a desire to read your Bible. Talk to him. Want to know him. Amen. I hope the Holy Spirit has inspired you today. I do. Well, Lord, I pray. I pray for us. Lord, if there's one here today, Lord, who, who wants to know you more, Lord, I pray there's more than one. Oh, Lord, minister right now by the person of your Holy Spirit into our hearts. Lord, break us, Lord. Break us. Make us whole. Lord, may we realize just how futile our efforts have been, how, how our righteousness is as, is, is as filthy rags. Lord, our sin is even worse. How disgusting our sin must be, Lord. How our own efforts, Lord, how our complacency is putrid in your sight. Lord, anything that we are holding in esteem above you, Lord. If we place our hobbies, our jobs, our families, anything above you, Lord, oh, remove it, Lord. Break us, Lord, that we would be repentant before you. Lord, if my people are call, who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. Oh, but we're not wicked. Oh, Lord, we are so wicked. Anything, anything. Lord, if you look at our righteousness as horse manure, oh, Lord, how could we say we're not wicked? Break us, Lord, and open our eyes, to open our hearts to want you more than anything. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for ministering to my heart, for reminding me, Lord, of that there's so much more to you than I'm experiencing right now. So, Father, I pray as a fellowship, we would come to a place of brokenness, of repentance, that we would see revival in, in this place, Lord. We would see revival in our land. Lord, let it begin here in the house of God. Father, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for each person you've called to this sanctuary, to this fellowship. Lord, you're doing something. You brought us. Lord, we're so, we, this is a special place. Lord, I love coming here. Lord, and, and, and you're ministering. I, I thank you for all the growth that we've seen. But Lord, we pray that we wouldn't be content hanging out here at the wall. Lord, we, we push through, break that wall down, Lord, to experience the, 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 the width and the depth, the length the, of, of your love, the knowledge of your love. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Have your way, Holy Spirit. There's a freedom in your spirit that, that we can't find anywhere else. There's a power, Lord, a resurrection power that, Lord, we would even be willing to suffer for you, Lord, that we would be willing to die to ourselves, as Paul said, that we might experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ in our life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just have your way, we pray. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Yes, Lord. Use us, Lord. You, may your gifts begin to excel in this and be used in this place. Lord, may, may we begin to see, Lord, the, the fruits of the Spirit like never before. Hallelujah. Deliverance, Lord. Salvation, Lord. Freedom, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I, I know in a group this size, there, there's many of us, Lord, who struggle with a sin, Lord, that we just, we just feel powerless against, Lord, that we've had it for so long. It's like a friend, Lord, like we wouldn't even know what to do with our life if it, if it wasn't there. Set them free today, I pray, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Touch their heart, Lord that they would want that removed. Not that they, that they would want you more than that sin, Lord. Reveal yourself, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Praise God. Well, Lord, I thank you for the day, for the words we've heard, Lord, for the songs we've sung. Lord, we just uh, grateful for the Collins family, for Pat, for all of them coming down to, to, to lead us in worship, to bring about, to usher in your presence into this place, Lord. And it's been good to be in your presence, to be standing here on holy ground, Lord. Anoint them again for the next service. Lord, anoint this room, Lord, for the word that, that needs to be spoken, the need, words that needs to be heard, Lord. Let it, let it land on fertile soil. Let it have its, take its effect, 
Lord, we pray. Bless all those who were, we, we came in contact with yesterday at the firehouse. Let that, Lord, those little trinkets and nuggets, Lord, uh, of, um, of Jesus that we spread, Lord. They were small, Lord, but in your hands they can do mighty things, Lord. Touch those parents today as they wake up and say, maybe we should go to church. Maybe we should start thinking about church. Whether it's this church or another church, it doesn't matter. Let them go be driven to, to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, we pray as it's Harvest Offering Weekend, Lord, that you would touch the hearts of all those to give, to see, to, to see your, your, your church here grow, Lord, and to, 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 to be able to build and to, um, to further, to advance your kingdom here in Dagsboro and, and there in Georgetown. Lord, touch our hearts as you would have us give, Father, and we just ask your blessing on each one as we do so, and Lord, and um, just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord.